Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's awesome that you're tuning in. So in this video, we're going to take a close look at something pretty damn awesome. This is a product I wanted to review for a very long time. The NVIDIA Shield from AliExpress. They call this thing the Phoenix One. And what is the Phoenix One? It comes with a very nice set of specifications. To begin with, with the Snapdragon 660. And this device has a lot of potential. But I wanted to do an extended review because there are some things that you need to know before you even consider getting something like this. So first of all, the settings itself, what you're going to get is similar like the NVIDIA Shield. I will explain you what I mean with that. Inside the box, we're going to get a manual. Yep. And this is more like a basic manual. And so far, I can see it's all in the Chinese language. But then we're going to get like 4 GB RAM, 32 GB of Nestero storage, quite some information. But we're going to show you later on what I mean with this. This is the system itself. It weighs quite heavy and it looks very cool. It's, yeah, let's say, like an eeny mini Xbox One device. It says here Phoenix One. I do like the decal at the front, glossy, and you can see like all the fingerprints. At the back, we're going to get the USB 3.0, 2.0, Ethernet RG45 connection, input for the power supply, and the HDMI out. And not to forget the headphone connection, something you don't see very often on these high-end devices. It also comes with the remote itself. Then we have an HDMI cable, and here we're going to get the power supply. It's a tiny one. It is only, let's see, 3 amps and 5 volts, so it's a quite a beefy system, yeah. It's a beefy special power supply, Phoenix One, and it comes with a very tiny barrel jack connection. But that is not all. There is nothing else in the box itself, because that didn't come in the box. Like with the Nvidia Shield, it also came with a controller. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so the controller is a very interesting story. It's similar like the NVIDIA Shield controller, only this is more like an Xbox clone. We're going to get very nice, maybe you can hear it on a microphone, that it's got very nice trigger buttons. It feels like a really nice, decent controller. Both nice rubbery joysticks, A, B, X, Y over here. The D-pad feels also very nice. It's a rechargeable Bluetooth controller. You can connect it with the micro USB. And of course, we're going to get the home button. That's basically the Phoenix logo when you press it. It starts blinking over here. Return button. And this is if you want to yeah, basically use this thing like a mouse, you can use that too. It's the same like with the controller or the remote. You can have this option too. But of course, remote is for volume control and other functions. Another issue I noticed is the controller compatibility. It's just a freaking nightmare if you ask me. So the original Phoenix controller you're going to see over here it works fine, but I did notice if you want to set it up with some emulators, there are some keys are not working or you can set it up. A little, little bit of a bummer in my opinion, but the weird thing is like I couldn't even get these two to work. Like the most common controllers that work basically on every freaking Android box. And that is also like a big issue, but here comes the fun fact. So I was digging around with Lesser in my box itself with all the controls and I found this controller. And guess what? I have this old school controller laying around from the brand Grevis and it seems to be working just fine on the Phoenix One. I didn't do a full review about this product. In the future I will do so and test it out on multiple devices. It's a weird beefcake and really weird piece of hardware with this, yeah, I can say like analog D style weird thing. Nevertheless, I got this from a fellow collector, pretty cool, but it seems to only be working perfectly on the Phoenix One game system. That is just a big bummer. So when you're looking at the device itself, it also comes with a stand that was still in the box. Yeah, I wanted to show you just by putting it under it. It's nothing really special, but it's like the finishing touch when it comes to this device. It gives it a lot of stability, if you want to put it, of course, in this position, like the standing position. So basically what you're going to get with the Phoenix One kit is just the same thing that you're going to get with the older model of the Nvidia Shield. And what do you mean with the Nvidia Shield? The first edition also came with the Nvidia Shield controller. Nowadays with the Nvidia Shield Pro, you're only going to get the system itself and the remote and you need to buy the controller separately. But then overall, I was let's say interested in this device itself because it looks nice, but how is it with the specifications? So let's take a close look at that and let's hook it up to my Elgato capture card. All right guys, so what are we going to get with the interface? First of all, I think it looks really nice and smooth, but it is not like the Nvidia Shield. We don't have all the applications and it also includes when it comes to the Play Store. 
when you want to boot something up you will get the message that you need to have a connection and even if you have going to be in connection setup i tried it with different boxes it doesn't work at all because this is clearly made for asian market so when it comes to gaming and all the future it's a little bit of a messy stuff especially when you're looking at the menu and all the stuff you see most of the things doesn't even boot up when you're having internet then we're having like the option to install yourself some apk files also here i noticed some issues like some of the game emulators doesn't even boot up but i got a lot of them working so we could do some testing here on the channel all right so let's check the specifications with ida64 so first of all the model is phoenix one what i do like about it we're going to get four gigabyte of ram in this device and we have a lot of internal storage total space but it's a really old product so that explains why we don't have 64 gigabytes something like that the qualcomm snapdragon 660 is not quite a beefy cpu and that makes this thing just really cool when it comes to gaming and for the gpu we're going to get ourselves an adreno 512 so and overall this device in my opinion has quite some beefy specifications let's check the android and we're going to get android 8.1.0 called oreo okay guys so let's start with the emulation testing first off gamecube and it depends what kind of game you wanted to play on this device in combination with the software dolphin because we're going to get some mixed performance but this game seems to be running just fine and it's not having unstable 60 fps sometimes it dips down but in overall it's playable if you ask me but with gamecube i think we are like already done with testing so i tried crash bandicoot a lot of different games but only seems to be like the, some of the first generation games that i've shown you before will work fine but like this is not running at all or it should be we're going to get this purple display every single time it's booting up this part is not really demanding you can see the fps is, rises up to the 60. but when we're going to play the game you can see it doesn't even hit the 30 fps and that makes this game just freaking slow and unplayable. And I noticed it, of course, with the more demanding game too, like F-Zero GX. That game was not even playable at all with 15 FPS. So when it comes to the GameCube, sadly, this device is not powerful enough. Alright guys, next up, PlayStation 1. But what I did change today is that we're going to have a higher internal resolution. And the reason is just simple. With the normal resolution, it runs just fine. Nowadays on Android boxes, with lesser power, we can run this. But I was thinking, what should we do when we're having like a beefcake of a system like this? Let's push it a little bit further. And you can see that it doesn't hit the 60 FPS. That's a little bit of a bummer in my opinion. And that is something we need to take consideration when you're having a system like this. So I wanted to try out two games. In this case, we're going to try out the first game. And you can see like when it's in game, we don't hit the 60 FPS. Of course, with a loading screen, we hit it, but that is more cheating. But let's try another game. Let's try R-Type Zelda and Shmup that is less demanding. Because you will see almost the same result. 56, 57 FPS, but when you're going to play you will see that we're hitting the 60 fps and having the full gameplay on this game but when you're looking at the game as this you can see that now it runs 60 fps 59 but i think it's just stable enough to enjoy this game having it two times the eternal resolution it looks amazing on this phoenix one and you can see like where a lot of these other android devices struggle getting this places one lifted up to a high resolution this Phoenix one has no problem whatsoever. So PlayStation 1 runs even with the 2 times resolution with some games. Okay, next up, Sega Dreamcast with the Redream emulator with a resolution of 640 by 480. And the reason I wanted to do it like this is just to see if we can run this game perfectly. And 60 FPS locked stable. Of course, take on consideration that even the Redeem emulator has some games that are not compatible, but in the future they will highly possible fix this all. But like this game runs perfectly and we can play it on full speed on the Phoenix one without a hassle. 
So next up, still Dreamcast. I just wanted to check out and quickly a different game if you're going to get the same results. This game is also very well supported. And you can see over here that this game also runs on full 60 FPS without any problem. So the Phoenix one is compatible with the Dream in combination with the Dreamcast games. And I think it's a pretty cool addition. Okay, so for the final test, I wanted to test out PlayStation Portable with the PP SSPP emulator. And this device runs the PlayStation emulator quite well. So when it comes to Tekken, you can see this game runs on full 60 FPS. There is no frame skipping, no other tweaks. It's just set to the basic settings. And I must say that I was surprised to see that this piece of hardware can run one of my favorite games perfectly. I'm always trying Tekken 6. The reason because it's just my casual go-to game to play, but also to test on these systems. And I noticed when you're looking at the low-end emulators, they all struggle with PSP in general. And with a beefy Phoenix one, with this Snapdragon 660, there is no problem whatsoever. So in the next test, we're going to try out Wipeout. For me, it's like the next level. If Tekken 6 runs fine with Wipeout, we're going to need some more power. So it's going to be the best test. Running now on 60 FPS stable. But when you can get an explosion, you can see it dips down for a couple of seconds. In my opinion, it's not a big of a deal. But I just wanted to show you that Wipeout doesn't run on 60 FPS stable when you're going to push it. Especially when it comes to explosion and stuff going on. But not overall, it got quite some good performance. Something you don't see on cheap boxes. The final test for PlayStation Portable and this box, of course, the God of War game on PlayStation Portable. And surprisingly, this game runs very good, but not perfect. You can already see that it's dipping down to the 50. And we're going to start playing, we see even dips up to the 40. And that is a little bit of a bummer. So you can see that this box is not powerful enough to run God of War on full speed. So in the next step, I want to add frame skipping to see if we're going to get some better performance. But when we are going to apply the frame skip on God of War, you can really see that we're going to get a stable 30 FPS and makes this game, in my opinion, playable. So this is what you're going to get with the Phoenix one. But when it comes to the performance, PlayStation Portable is just still a mixed bag. It's just, it's just a little bit of a bummer. I wish we could play this game at least at the full speed. But yeah, when you're looking at the other games like GameCube and the really high demanding stuff, it still struggles with the tiny box when a Snapdragon 660. All right, guys, so let's talk about the Phoenix one, the conclusion about this product. So first of all, the downside to this product is that it costs a lot of money. You're paying around the same amount of money when you're looking at the Nvidia Shield. So is it more like something unique? Yes, it is if you're looking at specifications, but not when it comes to the price. If the thing retails for 100 up to $150, it would be like a very cool bargain to get. So the performance itself was pretty okay. And the reason I say okay is because of a combination of the software problem. So when I wanted to boot up Sega Saturn, sadly I couldn't boot up some of these emulators and getting them from the store is in my opinion out of the question. I did some messing around with it, but the problem is like, you can see that this product is clearly dedicated for the Chinese market. So it was a little bit of a bummer for, if you want to use this thing in the US or European, it's going to be a problem. I wish they like released the thing with completely brand or cleaned up Android version with the Play Store. And yeah, it would be like a crazy thing to use because this thing, even with freaking God of War, we're going to get a lot of good performance compared with the Nvidia Shield. So I think I found myself a nemesis, but the Nvidia Shield, in my opinion, is still not defeated. I want to thank you for watching. Consider subscribing, hit that little bell, become one of the Wicked family. And it would be great to see you in the next video.